Senior Sojourners from the North Campus on September 15th, 2022. Well, I don't know, Sam. I don't know how you read that letter and only have one pause in there. You know, that's the kind of thing you read. And I think if you're anything like me, the rest of us feel like, go home now. What a treasure. I'm sure there's people in this room that would say, man, if I had something like that from my dad. <sighs> wow. I mean, it's just a wow. Thanks for sharing that. I don't think you could have used that time one bit better. Absolutely. Bless your heart and bless your dad. Bless that legacy. Absolutely. So, I just have kind of a skeleton outline up there. I'll read most of my remarks here, but who in the world am I and what do I have, you know, to speak into as far as uh, legacy? I, I just, from the outset, I want to say this is challenging. This is a challenging time preparing for a talk about leaving a legacy. I'm a physician. A lot of you probably have physicians who oh, talk to you about exercising and they know they probably don't exercise as much as they should. And maybe they talk to you about how big you are, and you look and see their body mass index isn't perfect either. Might even be physicians at the hospital who sneak into the janitor's closet and take a few puffs off a of Marlboro every once in a while, still. Well, I'll, I'll tell you, I'm a, you know, I'm a physician talking about leaving a spiritual legacy and there's much that you know uh, hits home for a guy who knows beyond a shadow of a doubt he could have done better when his kids were home could have spent more time could have simply enjoyed them more uh, and the time goes quickly I don't have to tell anybody in this room that it's long days and short years Right? Absolutely. So it's worthwhile thinking about this. Where there's life, there's hope. Right? There's life, there's hope. Our, our ability to influence and, and to make a difference isn't, isn't done in the flesh until we're done in the flesh. And thanks, Sam, for reminding us of that. I'm a family doc. I, I was trained broadly and, you know, was one of maybe the last generations of physicians who kind of did a little bit of everything, hospital and babies and clinic and everything. So I was blessed to start that way. Finishing up the last part of my career, now the last 12 years or so, doing facility care geriatrics. I take care of the frailest of the frail folks in, in places that, you know, nobody really wants, really wants to be. Um, and uh, it's been a priv I'll just say it's been a privilege to do it. It's a generation, I think, I've always been kind of an old soul. Um, grew up pumping gas for my dad at Standard Station. You learn how to talk to your community a little bit, and you're putting gas in the cars of people with gray hair, and you just you learn a little bit about how to, how to be with them and talk to them. And it's a, a skill that, you know, maybe is going away a little bit, just maybe. And I'm, I was probably groused a little bit about spending my Saturdays and Sundays from age 12 on kind of pumping gas when my friends were out doing other things. But I think as you get older, you realize that time probably kept me out of some things that I don't even know about the trouble that I could have ended up in and didn't. So, you know, and learned, learned a little bit about how to work and, and there's value in that. And it was, it was, uh, it was rich, I, and like a lot of things, there school years and teachers and things, I think we get a little more uh, appreciative for those things later when we look back. We need that perspective. Part of what I do now is I have family conferences with families and with people in long-term care, and um, it's a cornerstone, really, of the Genevieve practice. We just try to spend time with the families of people that have folks in long-term care. It's hard. Being in care is, is hard. And we value the story that people bring to long-term care, especially when they can't often tell us that story themselves all the time. 
you know, sometimes the farthest back things are still a little bit there, and they can, you know, that that's a, a bit of a blessing as cognitive things start to come in, is the long ago stuff is in a little different vault. And oftentimes you can still get a sense of, you know, what, what made people tick and who they were and what they did. And we value that. And we think it helps us take care of people better to, uh, to know their story. But um, so a lot of what I guess I've learned about uh, family things, you know, comes out of the being blessed enough in this season of practice to have that time to spend with people. It's kept, it's kept me in medicine. I, wasn't, I don't know if I'd still be a physician if I had to do 15-minute appointments and type on the computer while I'm talking to people. I never did that well. I just never did. And that's part of where my family got shorted because I had to do a lot of other stuff at other times. And, and that's a whole other story. But it's different now, and I've appreciated the last 10, 12 years where it's not about how many people I see every day, but what is there to do and who is there to be with. And if you need the time, you take the time, and it's been a blessing. Being in care is hard. It's hard for the resident. It's hard for the patient. It's hard for the people who love them to have somebody in a care situation. Um, it's not an optimal time, certainly, for high-level decision-making or considering for the first time important relational, financial, or medical issues or goals. Entering care and major medical changes that are there for all of us at some point um, really is, it, it gives us a sense that we have looming end-of-life issues that are coming up. And that scenario tends to magnify issues and problems that maybe could be kept under the rug a little bit when we or our loved ones were more functional and independent. It's, you can sweep a little bit things under the rug when things are kind of OK. But when they get to be not so OK and people's health transitions and they need to physically transition, it's hard to keep keeping stuff under wraps. So there's value, we believe. Honey, can you grab that bottle of water for me if you can? There's value of anticipating and visualizing ahead harder times to come. Things will not always be as they are now. That's for sure. Uh, the only thing harder than talking about hard things, and I say this when we do our family conferences, it's hard to talk about this stuff. But the only thing harder than talking about it and visualizing it and anticipating it is to be in the middle of it and wish you had, really. Um, future talk is of necessity. It's an impressionist painting. It's not a realist rendering. It's not. We know who sees the end from the beginning. Thankfully, it ain't us, right? So doesn't mean we can't try to anticipate some coming things and paint some broad brush strokes of things. And there's absolutely a limiting effect of cognitive decline on these kinds of discussions. There just is. And by the time the residents in long-term care, given the multiple layers of antecedent care that exists now, often the capacity for these discussions is lost. And discussions are being held with the residents' loved ones only. And they may or may not be privy to the deepest wishes of those they love and are now responsible for. Uh, it's a sad fact that there's a lot of vacuum out there in terms of what family members might know about the deepest wishes and who their loved ones are inside and who they have been. If there's any previous advanced care planning document or anything that's been done and a person is more functional, critical, that's important, uh, and certainly serves as an important jumping off place. You would like to know what people thought when they had the ability to think deep thoughts about very nuanced and difficult things, for sure. And these discussions, these kind of discussions about life transition and looming end of life are absolutely present a real opportunity to witness to our loved ones who may not be walking with the Lord. We get that from certainly Sam's words for us, too. 
Where's our hope? What do we value eternally? And what do we value as regards life in the flesh? What's important to us about our, our, the integrity of our personhood and our organism? Does our family know who we are deep inside, and do we wish them to? We have to decide that. We have to decide about how that will help them decision-make for us when we can't. And there's always in the best crafted plans things that are between the lines, not spelled out or able to be spelled out ahead of time in all cases, for sure. We find not uncommonly in our family conferences that storytelling leads family to places and outcomes that they may not have arrived at if the story and values of their loved ones had been a more closed book or not been given that forum for consideration. So let's get back to the magnifying effect of health and residential change, which are basically portents of the coming end of earthly life. And how do they affect our relational communication and financial issues? John and I, over 35 plus years, have seen these kinds of things play out multiple times and seen how it goes. So. Like a lot of things, uh, sometimes just some, a couple of cases, a couple of created cases, fictionalized composites, if you will, of things that have come up in, in these conferences over time may help to illustrate just some of the difficult issues and real life stuff that happens when, when people are, are, doing, are doing life together as families. Let's consider the case of Orly and Olive Oldman. And any resemblance to an actual name or family is completely A, miraculous, <laughs> and B, yeah, coincidental. Just the old disclaimer there, for sure. Orly's a taciturn Swede, and believe me, growing up in Cambridge, Minnesota, and growing up in the house I grew up in, I know a thing or two about taciturn Swedes. No two ways about that. Orly was raised on the Iron Range. He spent his life working hard, head down. A man of few words who let his actions do the talking. A former Marine, combat left its mark. And scars about which his family. I see these guys all the time. They're still with us, thankfully. It's a privilege to interact with them. Left scars about which his family has mostly been, had to guess, had to guess about those things. Dad, what'd you do in the war? What was that like for you? And the Marine thousand yard stare would come and the topic would get changed quickly. A lifetime of hard physical labor in the concrete business he started eventually ravaged his body and his mobility and necessitated turning the business over to his son, Oliver, who unfortunately struggled with drugs and alcohol and orally watched his life work eventually be sold off. Olive brought the kids to church when they were little, but orally never really saw the need for spiritual things. Hard work saves. Another daughter, Alice, lived with Orly and Olive, but also struggled with chemical use and ostensibly was there to help with the house and mom and dad's care, with Olive also now in a wheelchair from a failed knee, knee replacement. But sadly, Alice bled off their finances and was also a hoarder. Led to a situation where residence for Orly and Olive at home was simply no longer possible. Their other daughter, Adele, and her husband, Arnold, living in a neighboring town, solid marriage, prudent decision makers, agreed to become powers of attorney while mom and dad were still in their home, as Oliver had no interest or really ability, and Alice sadly committed suicide. It soon became clear remaining at home was no longer possible or safe for the two of them, and Adele and Arnold made the agonizing decision to place mom and dad in care and they've suffered the wrath of Orly and Olive ever since. Adele and Arnold are the children who will never be forgiven for taking us out of our home, away from the porch and the bird feeders. Never mind, the only birds that have been seen in the last six months were on the television, 
And there's been no path to the patio door for at least that long either. He was always one to hold a grudge, Idell says with a sad shake of the head. Family conference was held at the nursing home and Olive and Orly would not allow Adele in the room, only grudgingly allowing her husband Arnold. Their son Oliver wasn't there and his name really didn't come up. And I think John and I both know sometimes these family conferences, the most important people are the ones who are not there. At some point, you have to know what you have to reckon with there in terms of what influence are those who are not there going to have on the proceedings. Absolutely. Alice's suicide necessitated Adele's and Arnold's drafting as attorneys, in fact. Orley's memory is now failing as well, and like his life's work, the concrete in his mind and soul is hardening and he can never forgive Adele for not giving us a chance at home. 24-hour home care, the minimum that would be needed to manage the needs they presented, simply wasn't an option. Orly is totally power chair dependent, unable to transfer without the assist of two. He's unable to toilet himself, unable to bathe himself, and Olive is basically in the same situation. Despite attempts, and we tried, we tried hard to reframe thinking and things because we see the impact this has on people's hearts and on the hearts of the people that love them. Despite attempts for Orly's own sake and health to say nothing of the relationship with his most functional child, Adele, attempts to reframe with Orly and Olive about what in fact has landed them in care, health circumstance, and not a desire for their kids, Adele and Arnold, to run their lives. Those attempts were fruitless. As one might imagine, it's a source of great pain for Adele, and though Orly would never admit it, and Olive changes the subject quickly, it's painful for them too. Okay. That brings together a lot of things, and it's, it's hard, but those are all, that's a composite of real stuff that comes up when we talk to people about real life. I was going to call, call this next section lessons. You know, lesson, the word lesson implies that there's a course of study for these kinds of things. And if we simply study hard and learn the lessons, all will be well. And of course, we just can't, we can't go to that place. I have observations on these kinds of things, but it's important that we don't feel like there's a manual to go to, and if we just get to the right page, everything's going to be okay. Don't hold yourself to that in any of these kinds of interactions with your family. But communication, number one, communication is a currency of relationship. We can't assume our kids or spouse know who we are or what we value if we don't tell them while we can. And they should not be the last to know if our plans for help as we decline includes them. Right? Don't mistake physical proximity or the words, I'm here to help you, always with actual concern or the ability, in fact, to be of help. As we know, the healthiest among our inner circle, our children or those that love us, often are and not only may very well be, but usually are those who have left to craft a life for themselves. And, and if it comes to re-engaging with them or re-establishing relationship, even if that means swallowing our pride about things and seeking forgiveness for things done or things undone re relationally over a lifetime, that can certainly be our best move. Recognize people who love us, who really love us. Proverbs says, faithful are the wounds of a friend. Ideally, our kids are at some level our friends. They aren't exactly in that category, but we hope that their friends are adult children. And people who love us will say and do hard things that are best for us, even if we can't see that in the now. Recognize early with those you love that who may in the future 
being responsible for us that we know that we may say things and do things that are manifestations of failing memory and failing health and that also we recognize that they may need to decide things that we will not like in that moment but will be the right thing for us and that we appreciate in advance their willingness to do hard things for us. Insight, like Orly's, ossifies over time. It gets harder. It doesn't get any better. And we'll likely overestimate what we are capable of and resent attempts to align our need, which is obvious to others, but not to us, with the right amount and type of help. Forget about being any more objective about our situation as we get older. We can't be objective at any point, really, about our own situation. Uh, make sure we get objective financial help outside of our family to organize things and consider for power of attorney possibly those children who do not necessarily lobby for the designation, but who have the skills and who we see as the ones best suited for the job. Estate planning experts exist, and minimum, just make sure the beneficiaries on all the things that you have that involve money are right. And that goes a long way to, to help keep the division that unrighteous mammon can cause when we exit uh, this life to a minimum. And John and I both resonate with what money can do um, when that becomes a focal point. No matter who we are, have been, or how we have prepared or failed to prepare, we can't take responsibility ultimately for the actions of our adult children. We have a season of great potential influence that wanes of necessity over time, but there's never a point we had or will have control over the decisions and actions of even those closest to us, right? We barely have control over what three-year-olds are about at any given moment, right? Absolutely. So only God knows the precise interaction of his sovereign will with the presence of sin in the world and the impact that has on every family unit that's ever lived, is living, and will live. It's getting trite to say it, perhaps. We hear it a lot. But families are broken people doing life together. Absolutely. I suppose it'd be easy in some ways to craft a second case that is the antithesis of all that we saw above with Orly and Olive. Start talking about healthy, long marriage, joyful balance of faith modeled by both parents, work, family time, friendships, and renewing and replenishing recreation, everything in balance. Also healthy relationships with spiritually healthy and independent children, and then finally slipping off to heaven in our own beds at home, right? That's all of our desire. That's what we, that's what we want. I do want to leave on a positive note, and elements of what I've just said certainly happen in real life. Let's, let's remember, though, that as a consequence of the fall, Ideal exists mostly in fiction and dangerously in our minds and hearts as we look over the metaphorical fence to those we think we know whose lives we perceive as idyllic and godly, the earthly manifestation of all that is good, and we know that we do this. Beware that kind of comparison. Look for the good, surely, and engage those we see at church and in the community who seem to have what we aspire to and learn from them. It's part of doing life together, especially in the body of Christ. However, if we're let in to people's lives, and we know this from our small groups and from people we really know and love, we will learn of hurt and challenge in a parent to the higher level view that we thought represented all there was to see, right? It's a close-up view we're too often missing in our Instagram and TikTok world. And it's the view that Jesus calls us to in order to establish in our hearts beyond a doubt that he's the only perfect one. And all stand in need of him, 
no matter how Ward and June Cleaver life might appear from the outside through our ro rosy glasses. Dr. Piper says in Providence that Jesus alone is ground and goal of all that's good and necessary for the life that's life. And we praise him for his grace for undeserving sinners. We are all in that category. It's our only hope. It's no accident that experience teaches me, and I'm sure John and others who do what we do, that the best end of life scenarios are those where faith is strong and has been communicated to and embraced by the next generation. And there's value placed on life, but not just desperate clinging to this mortal coil. There's recognition that the curtain of life draws down and seeking comfort in the mechanisms of our passing and not necessarily escape from it as American medicine is often want to do becomes a good goal unto itself and enables the gleaning of quality even from our earthly field that looks like it's been completely harvested. Let's wrap up with the case of Hank and Helen, a lovely old couple in memory care. They both are in the late stages of dementing illness, not aware of where they are or why or what they just had for breakfast. But when they sit at table together and look at each other, each simply knows that's the one for me. This is not either's first trip around the relationship block. Helen had been married for years to a pastor and has a lovely gaggle of daughters scattered about the country who A, loved Helen, and B, love and communicate with each other. And oh, that is not a small thing to be taken for granted. Hank had been a pastor and lost his wife years before and also had some sons and daughters who thought highly of their dad and looked out well for his interest. It was a memory care love affair. And became clear that these lovebirds wished to do life together. Even in their misty consciousness regarding the details involving themselves and each other's lives. It seems Helen had enjoyed being married to a pastor, and she recognized godliness in Hank, and they lived each moment in the now. And this is a lesson from these dear people. They lived each moment in the now, unencumbered by regret of the past or fear of the future. Oh, what a lesson to be learned from those who are sadly locked into the moment, but blessedly locked into the moment. It's a silver lining to this cloud that we call dementia, and God's in it. He's absolutely present in it. Blended families are a challenge on many fronts, and maybe some of you experienced that. I've often seen the dark side when kids get their eyes on self and inheritance and off of mom or dad's happiness. To their credit, these kids from these two families demonstrated the godly maturity that had been plowed into them over the years and beautifully crafted a wedding ceremony in memory care to allow their parents to share their remaining time together in memory care in the same room as husband and wife before God, recognizing, recognizing even if Hank and Helen could not articulate it, and they could not, that this is what they would have wanted and expected in order to be the earthly picture of Christ and his church that marriage at any age or circumstance is meant to be. Bless these kids, there was no quibbling about what a union might mean financially. There was no clucking about how silly it was to worry about doing this for two people in dementia. Just eyes and hearts and souls focused on mom and dad and the one who loved them first 
and best and who ordains right order for human relationship. These kids are in my hall of fame of blended families and of grown children of people in dementia in general, living out what's true about so much of life, and we've heard it already. It's not about us, primarily, by a long shot. I could go on, but I'm over a little bit already. And rest assured, there's no real manual for this, guys. There, there isn't, save the timeless word that informs all of life and tells us who we are, even as it trumpets who our Lord of life is. We must simply try to love and keep channels of communication open with our future decision makers. Pray for them regularly. Yes, Sam, pray for them regularly. And remember to pray for our Olivers. Remember Oliver. Scan that horizon for the prodigal. For such as they are, were we all before him who saves us. Thanks. Sorry, but it's who I am. So... <laughs> little bit because Barry has just um, brought up a question that came up during our class in senior uh, in King's Friends this week and Barry I just want to thank you so much your heart is overflowing I think I think Barry and I were actually um, separated at birth we're all <laughs> from the same family um, just a word about where is the spirit in dementia. My wife's father had severe dementia of the type it's called Jakob Kreutzfeld. And it makes you very rigid and you look straight ahead. And you're like this at the end of your life. And he was living on ice cream and applesauce, which is what I want. Actually, <laughs> actually for lunch today. If, um, and and he got his pneumonia, and like Barry said, it was the end of his life. There was no reason to get excited about this. We knew he was dying, and five of his children, all of his children, five, and and all the spouses and his wife were at the bedside about 24 hours before he died. And my brother-in-law started this. He started talking to to his dad about what mattered from his dad. And his dad was a a Marine, but a quiet, gentle, godly man. He had jaw muscles that would stop you in your track, you know. But other than that, he was just a fantastic father-in-law. So we went around the room like a living eulogy, telling him what he meant to us. And then something absolutely miraculous happened. His eyes moved for the first time in six months and made eye contact with each one of us in the room, like that. And then he went back to being rigid and died the next day. So I th I've thought about that moment. I've talked about this moment many, many times. And it came up in a question from Paul Johnson on Sunday. And I, I, I recounted it to the King's Friends group. And I, and I recounted a lot because we, add, we wonder, where is the person when the brain dies? The person is there. Their spirit, while the outer man is dying, yet the inner man is renewed day after day, it says in Corinthians and other verses. Our spirit is fully alive, and God is administering that, and you all and we all can minister to that spirit no matter what we see at the bedside. So that, that last story brought up that. The spirits are there. <laughs>